In the last few years, a near consensus has been reached among climate scientists that not only does the planet's atmosphere only hold a finite amount of greenhouse gas emissions if we are not to exceed the 2 degree centigrade rise above the pre-industrial level le le uh, levels, uh, but also that our energy profligate lifestyles um, all around the world and particularly of course in Western countries are contributing to this process which is heading along a trajectory towards the extinction of life on Earth. That means that every conceivable decision that we make as individuals or as countries or as business has have got to be considered in relation to their association with or impact on the this capacity of the planet that cannot any longer go on being ignored. We're already way along a very, very dangerous route. We can no longer believe uh, that somehow or other by modest changes to our lifestyles uh, that we can avoid a catastrophe, maybe not uh, immediate, maybe not total in this century, but to a degree inevitable. Certainly this is a subject uh, which cannot be left to the individual to make up his or her decision as to whether they are prepared to take account of these impacts um, and no longer is it appropriate for it to be left to those who are prepared to act on it or to act on it to some degree uh, because it requires that everyone is involved Now, who can take that action? Obviously, it's only governments around the world that have got the capacity and the power and the responsibility uh, to take that action. They have got to intervene where the public interest is not being properly served by allowing individuals to go on ignoring these wider crucial consequences. It's got to be through the medium of government recognising its responsibility and obviously to ignore their understandable fear of not alienating the public from supporting them because they will be proposing something that the public are very likely not to welcome. Government sees its primary role as maintaining an optimism uh, amongst the general public that it is in control of public policy on climate change and for that reason it can be seen to be pandering to public opinion which does not want to make changes that it would prefer to avoid such as limits on flying if not total ban on flying for all the good reasons that would justify it if one hadn't to take account of the extremely damaging effects of the release of greenhouse gases in the upper atmosphere uh, where planes are used. The justification for that air travel being that uh, it is needed for maintaining family connections where those require intercontinental travel or likewise for business purposes or for touristic purposes must not be seen as the justification for continuing to exacerbate the problem of getting down to zero emissions if we are rarely to take the necessary steps to prevent uh, disaster. Indeed, governments see their role as primarily to serve uh, public demand, public preferences, uh, to enable them to lead lifestyles that they would prefer to um, maintain. The dangers of this stem from the fact that personal decisions are, in the main, taken without regard to the social and environmental consequences of those decisions.
uh, from that perspective, it is so obvious uh, that uh, decisions should not be based the decisions taken by government should not be based on uh, excluding the social and environmental consequences and in terms of climate change particularly uh, that consideration has got to be to the fore not to meeting uh, public preference. The essential process that is needed in this regard for governments to base their decisions and policies on uh, require a framework uh, within which they can operate. That framework then sets the boundaries within which they operate, obviously principally governed by what is known to be the global carbon budget of the atmosphere, not to exceed this two degrees. Such a framework has been developed uh, over in uh, the last two decades by the Global Commons Institute. It is called contraction and convergence. That is, of course, the contraction of greenhouse gases down to a safe level and as a part of that process, inevitably, uh, convergence towards equal per capita shares. Such a framework is based upon the principles of precaution and equity and justice uh, and uh, uh, re revealed in the publications of the Global Commerce Institute and on its uh, fascinating website. Um, it shows why the framework is needed and how it would be implemented. More recently, uh, the Global Commerce Institute has produced a model by which one can see whatever policies are proposed, whether it's in terms of uh, carbon emission reductions or in terms of the years by which those reductions are achieved, can be seen in relation to their effects on such issues at, as global temperatures, sea level rises, acidification of the oceans, um, and per capita emissions if these emissions are to be shared out on an equal per capita basis. Now I say equal per capita because there is a process when one's reducing that inevitably that will lead to more equal shares. But realistically nobody can on practical or indeed moral grounds argue that the, this finite uh, um, quantity of emissions should be shared out unfairly as it has been done in the past with um, uh, the Western countries having much bigger share of this limited uh, availability of the capacity of the atmosphere. Uh, equal per capita shares uh, will have to be introduced um, because there is no realistic alternative. Um, many have argued, and it is in fact the conventional view within governments around the world, uh, that we need not introduce carbon rationing uh, simply because it is far better to regulate demand through the medium of exhortation, information, um, taxation and regulation. And that then sets a price for the release of carbon and in the process uh, that then allows the market to operate in terms of the regulation of demand downwards. Um, in reality, uh, a system of rationing is far, far better uh, because the ration is determined by the capacity of the planet to absorb these emissions divided by the uh, uh, population at the time. And in order to arrive at as soon as possible at the zero emissions target that we must uh, uh, achieve uh, as soon as possible, um, it does mean that one would be having an annual carbon allowance year on year, um, uh, which uh, everybody in the population, uh, both in Western world and in third world countries would have allocated to them a yearly allowance uh, within which they would be living and they would um, give up those units of their allowance every time they uh, uh, pay for food which had a 
carbon component for its manufacture or for its production in, in, in any way or for its carriage uh, um, in any way um, for transport purposes obviously for heating and lighting in the home those would be given up. Such an allowance um, it is proposed uh, would be tradable uh, this would have a number of advantages it would certainly make it far more a far a more easy to introduce it uh, because those who led relatively energy profligate lifestyles uh, would then have to buy the surplus of those who were what I would call fossil fuel thrifty um, uh, their surplus which was left over but this whole arrangement would act like a double whammy. Uh, those who were energy thrifty would be hugely advantaged by selling their surplus units uh, where the market determined what that price was. But as the annual allowance declined, so would be the value of those surplus units. Wealthier people would not get away with maintaining their energy profligate lifestyles uh, because the cost of doing so would rise inexorably year on year as the annual uh, a global allowance declined and therefore they too would be energised so to speak in terms of uh, reducing their uh, fossil fuel dependent lifestyles uh, as quickly as possible down to a level uh, which would mean that they weren't paying out these vast sums in simply in order to maintain that, uh, uh, that energy uh, uh, expensive uh, lifestyle. The arrangement would have a further advantage uh, from a point of view of being socially progressive because in effect what would be happening was that poorer people who are far more likely uh, to not to use their annual allowance would benefit from that by being able to sell their surplus and therefore it would lead to a, in effect a transfer payment from wealthier people uh, to poorer people and poorer people don't fly uh, uh, people poorer people uh, certainly in uh, in uh, in the developing world don't have cars uh, don't have uh, uh, um, central heating in their homes and so on their surplus would they would be rewarded by being able to sell that surplus and that seems to be a very uh, good way of facing up to the is other issue critical issue facing mankind which is poverty in effect uh, the concept of the carbon allowance being tradable would act as a parallel currency could be seen as a parallel currency to money uh, because it would have a monetary value but since it was being given by the state for free uh, it would represent a means whereby every individual was involved every individual was informed about the need to respect the condition of the planet in their decision making and would be motivated uh, to or not only motivated but being obliged to fulfill their responsibilities uh, not to exceed their share of this limited resource. The carbon allowance would in my view uh, create a virtuous circle and in some ways I like to see it as a way uh, whereby one replaced the concept of the polluter pays principle uh, with the conserver benefits principle because the conservator conserver here would be the person who had a very low uh, fossil fuel based lifestyle um, and they would be rewarded it seems to me far better than the uh, polluter pays principle which implies that the polluters come conscience can be free because they actually could afford to pay for doing that damage. Um, when I report on the concept of tradable per capita carbon allowances or carbon rationing was first proposed, proposed uh, the Secretary of State uh, for the Environment at the time, David Miliband, very much welcomed it and thought that it was certainly uh, a subject that needed exploring. As a consequence, he commissioned a, a academics in the University of Bristol to look at it to see how feasible it was to introduce this. Uh, their report came back with two grounds for concern, which obviously informed uh, government at the time. 
Those concerns were as follows. Firstly, uh, that it was before its time, that it was premature to propose uh, carbon rationing at a time when the public didn't even recognise the significance of climate change. Um, an odd objection given that uh, we are already well beyond the point at which action needs to be taken to refer to that as uh, uh, before its time it seems to me somewhat droll. The second uh, objection uh, that was raised was that it would be too costly to implement to have everybody in the country, certainly every adult, uh, to have a carbon allowance given for, to them each year. But I find that remarkable because as a child I recall very well the introduction of food rationing uh, in 1939 and uh, during the war and uh, during that period we were just given uh, uh, very simple uh, ration books and you tore out the coupon when you uh, uh, bought your butter or your meat or, or, or whatever and as you uh, took those out there was none left to buy the same thing again until the next week we came up with, with your ration uh, moreover it's obvious that in this day and age uh, the advances in technology with regard to swipe cards or uh, uh, solutions like that for or telephone cards for reducing uh, a fixed uh, amount of a commodity um, would be extremely easy to introduce and extremely cheap to implement. I would like to make reference to the prospects for political negotiations uh, to achieve significant outcomes. Uh, at this point in history, so to speak, uh, one can refer to the next uh, meeting of the uh, um, relevant parties in Paris, which are gathering again in December of this year, 2015, um, in order to indicate, as they were requested at the last major international meeting, to say what contribution each country is prepared to make um, to um, cutting back on uh, carbon emissions in particular. But it is ridiculous to think that any significant breakthrough could be made when the representatives of each country have a brief which is to do as much as possible to protect the, their national interest. But their national interest is to make as little contribution as possible because of the substantial changes that are required in the behaviour and, and, and the activities of the populations of their countries. What successful negotiations require is an international commitment to set global interests above national interests and indeed national interests above personal interests. The time is long over for burying our collective heads in the sand and paying little more than lip service to the needs uh, of uh, policy to be so dramatically changed as is necessary to meet the challenge of climate change and limiting uh, the damage that is in prospect. The integration of the moral dimension is a further basic element, in my view, of this whole process. Uh, and that includes not only our behaviour in terms of currently largely disregarding the wider implications of our own decisions, but the moral dimension associated with the fact uh, that decisions are being made without regard uh, to the impact on future generations. And I made reference to this in uh, 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 an earlier part of the film in referring to the legacies that we're bequeathing to future generations. It's clearly insufficient to draw comfort from the fact that in some countries um, considerable progress has been made in one aspect of this subject or another, or individuals making commitments uh, um, uh, to uh, minimising their dependence upon fossil fuels, because this is a global problem that requires a global solution. Uh, even if, for instance, uh, in the hypothetical case that Europe 
uh, by virtue of its strong political links within the European Union, uh, were to have a policy of achieving zero carbon emissions by 2020 or 2030, we would not be able to sit back because other regions of the world uh, would be needed to uh, uh, adopt uh, uh, identical policies or near identical policies in order for that to be actually uh, um, contributing to the universal uh, changes that are necessary. The prime responsibility for these changes clearly lies and not with the individual but with governments. Uh, governments are the ones that have got to dictate um, what is needed to be done and it must not continue to shield itself behind public wishes, public ignorance, uh, 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 desire of the public to look aside when faced with the realities of what is needed. It, this can no longer carry, be carried on. We are surely beyond the period of denial about the threats of climate change uh, and beyond the point at which we can continue to believe that it is individual action uh, that can work out over time as delivering sufficient change uh, to um, benefit uh, the uh, benefit future populations uh, that cannot go on. The response will have to be far more ambitious and wide-ranging uh, and unless we act in that way we can be certain of the fact that we will be passing the planet on to future generations in a dire state.